This evening's Hilly Chase speaker is Patrick Mahoney, member of the Eagle Brook class of 1983 and parent of Rufus, class of 2020. Mr. Mahoney also currently serves as a trustee of the school. After Eagle Brook, he attended Tabor Academy and then St. John's College. Following college, Patrick created and invested in several startups in the dot-com world. More recently, he switched his focus to working full-time in the nonprofit world. He is here tonight to speak to us about the Rwanda bookmobile. Welcome, Mr. Mahoney. Thank you, everybody, for this opportunity. Um, I'm wearing fleece, and I'm going to take it off because I'll start to sweat really quick here. Just a little nervous. I've been on this stage a couple of times before. In 1983, I gave an assembly about our school trip to the Amazon River in Peru, and that was an unforgettable trip. Um, that's a talk for another day. Um, tonight, I'd like to talk to you about uh, what I've been working on in Rwanda, and the goal that we have there is to promote a love of reading. And I'd also like to share a little bit about my experience with philanthropy in general, what I've learned since I shifted my focus. So how did this start? Um, I was on campus here in late 2018 to visit Mr. Chase, and I mentioned that I was going to visit my sister in Rwanda. She had recently moved there, and I was curious to see the place. I really didn't even know where it was on a map. And Mr. Chase, being the most amazingly connected person I've ever met, said, would you like to try to meet with the first lady there? He got out his phone, sent a WhatsApp message, and boom, my adventure began. Um, the footnote here is that Eagle Brook is known even in Kigali, and that two of the president's sons are Eagle Brook alum. If you didn't already know how special this school is, um, think about that for a second. So this is a look at the city of Kigali and also the mountains in the west where the volcanoes are. Rwanda's a beautiful place, period. It's, it's stunning. And it's filled with people who express and practice gratitude on a daily basis. Many of them survived one of the darkest, most brutal moments that humanity could ever dream up, and they're determined to build a new nation that can be a model for Africa. The younger generation is vibrant, optimistic, and they're working very hard to prosper together. About half the population is under 18 years old. There's a lot of cool stuff going on in Rwanda, too. <clears throat> this company is called Zipline. It's a state-of-the-art medical delivery drone network doing over 250 flights per day from each location. These drones don't have pilots. Uh, it's all uh, AI, and this guy here in the control center has a fleet of maybe 30 or 40 birds in the air at any given moment, and they land uh, on a wire that you can see in the upper left, kind of like a plane's coming in on an aircraft carrier. It's, it's, it's awesome. Um, I got a video of one. I'll try and play for you. So they drop uh, blood, they drop pharmaceuticals anywhere within, I don't know how what their flight time is, but they can cover most of the country. And consequently, Zipline has one of the best pharmacies in the country right here. Um, See. Another group that's prospering there is called Question Coffee. They have 30,000, maybe it's even closer to 40,000 women farming coffee in the hills. Um, they got started with some support from Bloomberg Philanthropies, and, and uh, they created washing stations. They've got a store in Kigali, and this is some of the best coffee I've ever had. Um, this group in the upper left w invited us to come visit their farm, and you park, and you walk through the hills. It looks like northern Italy. It's beautiful, and you hear singing and you get closer and you see them dancing. And what my sister didn't tell me is that, like Fight Club, if this is your first visit, you have to dance with them. And there's no video of that. Thank God there's no video of that. Um, the NBA is making a big push into East Africa as well. Uh, that's my sister standing next to NBA greats Matumbo and also uh, Joachim Noah. She's, she looks tiny compared to these guys. Um, she was there for the championships of the first season of the Basketball Africa League. And the most recent good news is that uh, President Kagame was informed that the UCI is going to have the first African Road World Championships held in Rwanda in 2025. 
And I highly recommend this documentary, Rising from Ashes, if you're interested in, in Rwanda, you're interested in bicycles, these guys have gone from nothing to world-class um, cycling in one generation. All right, so that's the vibe. This place is happening, it's young, and it's growing fast, so off I went, having no idea, like I said, where Rwanda even was on a map. Um, I arrived into Kigali after sunset. At the equator, the sun sets at 6 p.m. like clockwork, and it still throws me off a bit when I visit. The air smells like charcoal wood fires that most of the houses use to cook dinner. The stars in the southern hemisphere didn't quite look the same, and I was seriously jet-lagged after 24 hours of travel from Greenfield to New York to Amsterdam to Kigali. But I got there. And immediately, my sister took me on a sprint through the country. I could barely keep up. Um, I met so many people and tasted new foods and drinks and culture, I, my head was spinning. Um, the Akagera Park is, I don't even know how big it is, but you can drive around in there for days and there's this herd of elephants actually got pretty grumpy that we were that close and turned on us, so we left, but uh, zebras, lions, it's, it's, that, that alone is worth a trip to Rwanda. When we got back into the city, um, <coughs> We visited uh, the Nyamarwambo Women's Center. That's, that's pictured on the upper left. It's, um, it's a collective where women work together to make clothes and bags and toys to support their families. And they pool their resources to make this whole library that I'm standing in. And that's where I got the idea for the Rwanda Bookmobile. I mean, that library is maybe the size of one of your Eagle Brook dorm rooms, but it had a real vibe to it. So you can see the kids in the middle. I went back on a subsequent trip with a bunch of Eagle Brook gear and soccer balls and it's, it's, uh, so there's little kids running around Kigali with Eagle Brook swag. Um, as I was packing to return to the U.S. For my, on that first trip, I got a message from the First Lady's office saying, come visit us at the presidential offices, which are part of a really pretty and super secure compound on the hill overlooking the city. We showed up with some gifts, and we really didn't know what to expect. And uh, we were greeted by two amazing women who I refer to now as our big sisters. They're there, there with me in the middle on the bottom. They run the Mbuto Foundation, which the First Lady started maybe 25 years ago. Their love for Rwanda is profound, and I'm, I'm really proud to, to call them our friends. So while we were meeting with the First Lady, who's lovely, um, we started to hear children's voices outside singing. And I hadn't slept. I mean, I had drank so much coffee. I hadn't really slept. I had to ask if anybody else heard it, too, or was I starting to come unspooled? First Lady smiled and said, you're all invited to our end of the year children's party. A couple hundred children are invited every year, a few from every corner of the country to, you know, it's kind of like Christmas. They revere her like a saint and she loves them like a mother. When we walked outside, there were hundreds of kids and little kids in bright colored shirts running around, playing games, getting face paint. It was kind of surreal. Um, but this was no coincidence. Uh, this was the beginning of the idea that, that today is the, the bookmobile. These pictures um, here are from the following year when she invited us back to entertain, to entertain all of the kids. So I went home and talked with my wife, Wheaton. It's her birthday today. Happy birthday. I love you. It's you. Um, and I started to work. And I, I have basic questions. This happens with any startup. How do we do this? What is this even? And, and I hadn't felt that since, since my days of creating tech companies. But it's kind of like a fever, and I had it. I still have it. But this one's different. This one has to be a nonprofit. So I started to build a team and a foundation. The corporate stuff's easy. Spreadsheets are my, this is dorky, but they're my creative canvas. Um, I raised money, and we started slowly, and I reached out to another Eagle Brook alum, Matt McInerney, who made this logo for us, which I love. Um, so I went back to Rwanda in early 2019 and, and kicked off the project for real. And that gentleman in the middle there is named Pacific. He's the first person we hired. He's very special. Um, so this is an important footnote I wanted to put in here. We, we asked the Big Sisters and Abuto Foundation, how do we go about this and be delicate because we don't really want to step on any toes and we want to be sensitive to the cultural differences, right? Because we're Americans. This is Africa. We didn't want to act like some other international NGOs that we had seen and we didn't want to be the rich Americans who were going to tell people of Rwanda what to do or how to do it. So we created a local nonprofit and an American counterpart. And the American side provides money and that's about it. 
um, and books. The local Rwanda organization has its own board and its team. You can see a lot of our team there in that array of pictures, faces, smiling faces. Um, and we, we did this as we thought about the future. How can we build something sustainable? What happens if we leave? What happens if we have to leave? Um, which is possible. Uh, so we're building a sustainable, small, and efficient organization there with and for the people of Rwanda. So Pacific, I mentioned him. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about our team for a few minutes. I'll start with him. We asked to, uh, we asked to see where the children's section was at the public library, and he was sitting there with the Peppa the Pig book on his desk that had wheels, and it was basically a little, bo little bookmobile. And he started to talk to us about his experience. And my sister and I looked at each other, and we knew immediately, this is the guy. This is the guy we need. So we asked him to talk a little bit more, and we were floored by his story. He grew up without parents. He wrote and published stories and worked very hard to get an education, which he got. Uh, he, he, he paid for and earned an undergrad and even a master's degree. He, this guy. This guy's a national treasure. Um, he's well known as a storyteller, and his devotion to children is unrivaled. Um, so he was the first person on our team who appeared before us exactly at the moment we needed him. Sometimes startups look easy, and people don't understand. It's it's really um, when you're when you're open to opportunities and you see them and you can adapt, then you can make things work. Sometimes they're hard, but this one's going well. Um, so this is specific. Um, I, I'm not, I've done these for all of the team. I was just in Rwanda two weeks ago, and I'm not going to ask you to sit through all of them. You can see them on our website. But I would like you to hear his voice and see his smile. Um, he's a happy, happy man. <laughs> Nitwa Pacifique Mahirwe. Ah, ndo muri Rwanda Book Mobile. Ibi mwishimisha cyane ni byinshi cyane nkunda gusoma ibitabo nkakunda no kuganiriza abana ariko byumwe hari ko nkakunda umwana. Hari ku wa mbere nari niciye muri office ahantu nakoreraga muri Kigali Public Library niciye mfita kaka modoka imbere yanje. Patrick na Shannon nibwo baje basanga afite akazi kenshi ndi mu mashini nari ndimo kubara amasomero yose yo mu gihugu barangije baranganiriza bambwira igitekerezo ko bashaka gutangiza umushinga muri iki gihugu cy'u Rwanda witwa Rwanda Book Mobile nange kuko nkungu ndi bitabo kandi nashakaga kubikora nuko nanye ndishima dutangira gutyo Rwanda Book Mobile ibiravutse Mu bintu bineze za muri timu ya Rwanda Book Mobile nuko bwa mbere na mbere dutekereza ku mwana mbere yo gutekereza ku bindi bikorwa byose igitabo kibihe byose igitabo cy'amere cy'abana nkunda ni igitabo kitwa All the Places You Will Go by Dr. Seuss ni igitabo nkunda cyane natangiye gusoma kera cyane nubwo ariko nkakunda ubutumwa burimo ariko nkakunda na Gifted Hands na none na Five Love Languages cha Gary Chapman hamwe na Gifted Hands ya Benjamin Carson Rwanda ku mobile maze ko kungeza kure cyane cyo nakwifashisha nuko byatumye mfunguka mu mutwe nkabasha kuba nakumva yuko icyo ngomba gukora ruko ngomba gukora ibitabo by'abana kandi nkaba naratangiye kwandika nibitabo bitandukanye byabana urumva rero yuko Rwanda buko mobile ntaza kwigira ntabwo nayo gutekereza ko shobora kuba nakwandikira umwana um everybody's a storyteller on our team they they even got me in front of the camera and uh, microphone on my last trip this gentleman's name is Emmy and he's known throughout Rwanda as Papa Yambi which means Papa hugs Papa who gives hugs um, he he was a taxi driver and he arrived to pick us up one day and his smile and his attitude I, he never stopped smiling he had a he had a Wi-Fi hotspot in his car and the the spot hot the hotspot was called smile and the password was stay forever this guy's he's love and um, when we went to visit the Minister of Education the other day, we weren't going to get in, but the secretary recognized him and wanted, to, wanted a selfie, so we got in. Um, it's good to have celebrities on your team. Um, we have, uh, the team's growing. Uh, this is Feli. She, she is a, uh, she's also a, a principally a storyteller, and 
you wouldn't know it now, but when she first arrived, she would talk into the microphone really quiet. She just she was terrified of it. And so we got her on the radio, and now she's she's amazing. She's an she's an amazing storyteller. We went to visit a school for blind children, and there was a young man there who stopped and said, "I'm." I don't know what you look like. I don't. I. I am absolutely in love with your voice, which just melted her. Um, um, this. This is the rest of our crew: Jolly Joe, Daniel, Edgar, and Lily, all of whom thought they were being hired for certain things, and they were. Jolly Joe's an accountant. Daniel does social media. Edgar is a wizard with bicycles, and Lily is a bookkeeper. They're all storytellers too. Uh, it's kind of. Uh, it's kind of the way that we've evolved. And this, this mission, this structure of this team and the sort of creative energy behind it comes from my sister, pictured here with a gorilla. She's, that's the look of terror in her face, not of, not of joy. And Rufus even made a trip um, uh, over to see it. So she's the reason I went to Rwanda to begin with. And she just loves children, all of them. Um, she saw the need to include sign language in our television shows. And she saw the need to, to uh, get books printed in Braille. And she sees what needs to happen, and we do our best to follow her and keep up with her. Um, I'm going to play this video. This is Naima. I dropped off a, book of, a box of these Legos for the library here at Eaglebrook to borrow. They're Braille, and they have the letters printed on them so that you can get acquainted with the level one Braille alphabet. Learn to read Braille even if you're not blind by name. She's so cool. Shannon also created a junior board of directors, and they're, they're rough, bless you. They're tough. They're way more intense and active than our actual board of directors, made up of adults. Um, look, there's no way I can sum up all the things Shannon brings to this project, but I will suggest to you that if and when you get ready to make a startup, find a co-founder with endless energy um, who's willing to fight for what they believe in and, and fantastic creativity, but also, and this is the most important, that you both understand what is the mission and that you adhere to it and you stick to it. So this is our library. Um, you know, we... Uh, Oh, where is it? So, so we toured Kigali looking for a place to make an office. And parts of Kigali are very rural, and then the parts of it look like you know a small modern city. And um, and I'm used to that vibe from from San Francisco, from LA, and it just didn't feel right there. So we looked around and we found a, this compound behind a church, and most of the offices were available for rent. And that courtyard was filled with garbage. It was a total mess, but there was a there was a vibe to it. And just down the just down the street. There's a school with 2,500 primary school children and a headmistress from Congo with a smile that just won't quit. And she said we could come to speak with her kids anytime we wanted. So that's how we got started. Um, I cried the first time I sat in the back of the class and, and listened to these storytellers and, the, and listened to the questions that the kids asked. It's, it's, it's really it's profound. Um, so our collection of books was starting to stack up. Eaglebrook and Deerfield and Bement all donated books. I bought books. I was traveling with five or six giant suitcases every time we got on a plane. Um, and we built a big collection, and we needed a space to store them. And we needed a space to welcome people and entertain children. So we asked the church if we could build this library building that you see there with the columns and the, the lights. Um, and the Bookmobile Library was born, and you're all invited to come visit. Um, that's some of the stash that came from the, the library here at Eaglebrook, and uh, there, that's our team. Originally, we, uh, that's the school down the street. So Rwanda has a varied history with languages in schools. Everyone over a certain age pretty much speaks Kinyarwanda, which you heard Pacific speaking. I tried to learn it. It's way over my head. Maybe Rufus can learn it. Um, but, but everybody speaks Kinyarwanda, and, and if they're over a certain age, they learn French as well. But not too long ago, the government switched that, so everybody under a certain age speaks Kinyarwanda and English. Our team speaks all three languages, except from this guy. Um, but the division becomes pretty clear as you move around and meet people. So we chose to stock books in all three languages. You see in the upper right, that's all the same book translated. 
differently. Um, so our library was built and our collection grew into a pretty respectable number of, of languages and we got really good at telling stories and visiting schools and this is pictures of some of the some of the schools that we would go to and and like I said the the gratitude of the teachers the kids it's it's um, it's it's impossible to convey in my words or in some of these pictures but at least you get a view into uh, into their world so we started rolling suitcases filled with books to visit schools then we made that cart that you saw then we imported that Toyota bus from Dubai um, and we were able to visit classrooms and it's really amazing to be part of this um, because the kids had been equating books with homework, um, reading as work. Our storytellers have been able to help some, I hope most of the kids to see that books are not boring, well, the books we read, not work and it's not punishment. Books and reading are magic and they open up the whole history of the world to us and we were getting into a good groove and then COVID hit. COVID, like everywhere else, rolled in like a storm. Um, I managed to leave a few days before the airport closed in March 2020, and lockdowns and school closures ended classes for the year. My sister stayed. She lives there now, and, and that saved our project. I can't exaggerate how important that was. So in one sense, we were out of business. Schools are closed. Kids are at home. You know, companies are laying off employees. Stores are, and hotels are folding. It's a big tourist economy there. And we had to dig deep. And, you know, the, to their credit, the Rwandan government did a very good job of managing the pandemic, but the impact on children is a huge problem and it's gonna be felt for years to come. There is internet access in Rwanda, but only for a small group that can afford it. So forget Zoom classes, that's a non-starter. Smartphones are still a luxury. Most people use flip phones. Um, and broadcast television has a pretty good reach, but uh, there's a big segment of the population that doesn't even have electricity. So we focus on radio. We, we, we guessed right. Um, radio was our way through the storm, out of the storm. And we shifted our business from in-person instruction, in-person storytelling to the radio, and we became a media company. We contacted several radio stations and asked them to partner with us. And our storytellers moved from classrooms to the studio. And our library shifted from being a library to become a studio. Um, you know, thank God for Sesame Street and Schoolhouse Rock and all of those great shows that we watched as kids. They're on YouTube. You can look them up. Um, they paved the way for us decades ago. So we, we, didn't, in, we didn't invent this. We just retooled it for a, a, a more modern setting. So we're on the air uh, all week, mostly on the weekends, but, but throughout the week. And we're researching grants and gifts now to try and get a lot of solar-powered radios into the hands of the poorest families so there's still a lot of work to do, but we are reaching millions of children. They call into the radio stations and their voices will melt your heart. Um, they talk to Papa Yambi and Mama Nina, that's the name of Feli, and, and, and they just scream into the phone. We ask them questions and it's a lot of fun. Uh, w again, following our love of Sesame Street, we were able to make two complete seasons of a TV show called Soma Some, as you can see on YouTube. Um, and it was broadcast on TV nationwide throughout the lockdown. And each show has a theme of cooking or sports or science, and, and each show has a corresponding box of materials that we share with libraries. Um, I, can, I, mean, I can hardly explain how different Sesame Street style looks on TV over there compared to what is normally broadcast. These kids have never seen anything like this. It's like we beamed in from a bright, colorful, happy planet of storytellers, and, and they're ready for it. Um, on the social media side, you know, we do have those streams of images and news, but it, it's not really for the children that we serve. They're, they're, they're useful and, and we engage it, but it's for the rest of the world and for the government to be able to see what we're doing. They're a big help with fundraising and awareness and we're getting asked a lot if people can come visit and volunteer their time. So social media is working to help us tell our story to others who care. Um, and if any of you wanna make the trip to Rwanda, I would be happy to help coordinate that. It's a long way to go, um, but it's more than worth it. Short of making the long trip over there, we love having guest storytellers read on videos so that teachers in Rwanda have more resources to use in their classrooms. Eagle Brook students and alumni have already started to do this. There's Gavin Mariani in the upper corner, he is at Deerfield now, and, and, and Henry Murchison, who's the most recent, reading Green Eggs and Ham. 
there's, a, there's proof. I actually did get on the video and read one. Um, and this young guy with the crazy cool glasses is a painter uh, that, we, that we discovered while we were there. And he read a book about color theory to the kids. It was pretty amazing. Um, I, was, I was looking at that article, Reading Writers Project. So we have a... We get some love from the media from time to time. Here are some articles. Uh, and, and just on Monday, we were on French television. They, they followed us out into the countryside to, to uh, follow Pacifique with a, a program that we've got going with these bicycles. So let me talk about the bicycles. The most crazy chapter of this story, I love, just, I'll call it bikes. I love bikes. I, uh, I see lots of you out on the EBS trails all the time. Bikes, bikes are magic. In Rwanda and in other developing countries, they could be life they can be taxis, they can be pickup trucks for the most outlandish cargo you've ever seen. And they can help families transport fresh water to their homes, and they do. I have no idea how they ride rickety bikes loaded with 180 pounds of water jugs, but I know why they do it, they have to. Um, my dad and his neighbors in the Pacific Northwest called last October and said, what would you do with 500 bikes in Rwanda? I didn't know what to, uh, to say except yes, thank you, send them. <laughs> I'll figure it out. Um, so we bought a sea container, and they spent eight months filling it with donated bicycles. People in Washington and Vancouver just showed up, you know, and it looks like chaos on the basketball court, and actually that was chaos. That was the first 200 bikes, and it was, from trying to match front wheels with bikes was like the weirdest jigsaw puzzle t challenge, but it was, it was a lot of fun. I tracked the ship. You can see in the upper corner there. Uh, I tracked it all summer as it visited uh, Japan and Singapore and India and Kenya, and finally it arrived in Dar es Salaam. And there's a lot of talk in the news about ships and delays at ports, but somehow we made it through without much drama. Uh, a, big, a big truck then hauled it across Tanzania to where we met it a few weeks ago. I got to be there to watch as a giant crane, and I have no idea how we got such a big crane out to the middle of nowhere. Uh, picked up 12 tons of metal, lifted it up over that hedge, and dropped it into its new home at a community library. Now, I said I love bikes, and I do, but I really didn't understand how many bikes 500 bikes really is. It's, it's 500, it's a lot. So as we started to unpack the container, a crowd started to grow, and you know, these aren't trash bikes. There's a Trek, there's a Schwinn, there's a Specialized. I was blown away by the quality of the bikes we were given. And, and not only that, they, they paid for everything. This group in the Northwest, they, they, paid for the, they paid for the shipping, they paid for the truck, it was everything, it was a blessing. Um, so I wanna take a, a segue for a second in, in the theme of a blessing. Um, uh, oh, this is the team that, sorry, before I do that, this is the team that helped us put the bikes together and I had to throw in a picture of my little sister with her original first bike when she's a little girl. That's me trying to ride one of the industry standard bikes in Rwanda, and I fell over shortly after this picture was taken, because that thing's damn near impossible to ride. But they make it work. Um, philanthropy and the power of giving is, is really what's going on here with me. I, I love working with my sister. I love the books. I love the kids in Rwanda. But there's a why to this. I've been talking about the how and the what. Um, so the power of giving, the power of service work, is hard for me to express, but I'll try. Aside from being with my family, this is the only way I want to invest my time at this point. And I highly recommend you Google this guy or look him up on Wikipedia. He's a badass. Um, and a brief aside, you know, I, I've chased fame and I've chased fortune and I've made and I've lost and I've made piles of money. I've been in magazines and I've had fancy titles and none of it even comes close to the joy of working for others and for me, for these kids in Rwanda. They don't even know who I am, and I'm okay with that. Um, giving doesn't have to be a, a two-way exchange. I don't need the recognition. Um, go back to Chuck. He's, he was sort of wrote the book on that. And when I was a student here, I was inspired to learn, and I was given more than I ever realized at the time. I grew up, and I learned how to compete, and how to win, and how to take what I needed. But ultimately, those wins and that kind of competition really did make me happy. Um, there was never enough. Somebody always had more stock, more headlines, more cash, more, 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 more. 
I stopped. I mean, it's okay to succeed and to have nice things, don't get me wrong. I got a bike collection. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's, you gotta define this for yourself, but, but on the inside, really, I was looking for something else. And it took me a while to remember what I had learned here at Eagle Brook, but I got there eventually. I was only a student here for two years, but I've spent decades as a member of this community. And I think of these faces here as family. And so in the upper right, me in 1983 and Rufus in 2020. So I'm glad that tradition continued. So, I, you know, I, f I found it. I found what I was looking for, um, which is to give instead of to take. And I had come full circle to my days at Eagle Brook where patient teachers gave me lessons, gave me encouragement, gave me a sense of how to navigate this world. So the mission I'm on is a chance to pay all that forward and to give back without expectations. All right, so back to the bikes. What are we gonna do with all these bikes we were blessed to receive? Um, we came up with a project and we call it Reading Riders. And that's who those, that group in the middle is there with me and I have my red mask on. That's the pilot group. So we're creating a network of hubs around the country and bringing bikes to those libraries and community centers and teaching, well, in some cases, teaching them how to ride bikes, but then sending them out into the community to read to children. And it's, it's awesome. Reading, you know, it's a way for us to get back to our original vision and, and a vital link to reading directly to the kids. They have baskets on their fancy new donated bikes and books from their libraries, and they can go farther and faster than we ever could um, dream of going in our Toyota. Um, our team returned to the classroom last week, and this is what they were greeted with follow, following them down the street. <laughs> Yambi. These kids are yelling, you can't hear it, but they, they, and you've heard a little bit of the music. Um, w w around the same time we made a logo, we made a theme song. Again, I'm not inventing this playbook. Eagle Brook does it well with a, th with a song and a logo and all of these things. They're important to rally around. And it blows my mind when we go to the middle of nowhere and we turn on the radio and these kids, they know the song. They know because they listen to the radio. It's, it's, it's so much fun. So, um, I guess what I want to say is if you're truly present and calm, the way forward with your project, the way forward as you think about, well, anything, the schools you're going to go to, the jobs you're going to take, answers will reveal themselves and opportunities, they're going to appear like they're falling from the sky, but it's not a coincidence. I believe if you're on a mission that helps people, others will recognize it and they'll see you and they'll help you and then you'll be sent messages like this. Thank you. Thank you for giving me bicycle. God bless you. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> so he's happy, and that makes me happy. Um, so I have um, I have one more clip I, I would like to play for you. I may stop it in the middle because I've already covered some of what, some of what's in there. But I want to introduce you to my sister, and she's she's in this video. She's 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 a key part of this. Um, and you'll hear our theme song again. So that's our whole team, and some of the kids who are working on our junior board. <laughs> Around the Bookmobile is an adventure. It started with a vision with Patrick visiting me in Rwanda. It grew in from a bicycle to a library to a media to a reading writer. Actually, it's movement and it's energy of helping children in Rwanda learn to love to read. The, the mission has always been the same, to inspire children to love to read with books like this that, that we have read to our own kids and who are a little bit older now and, and I was home and I looked at the library shelves in our house and they're filled with children's books 
and I came to visit here, and we went to uh, Yamirumbo Library, the, the Women's Center's library, and there were some books, but, but clearly there could be more. And that mission has stayed true regardless of how or what projects we're working on, whether it's um, taking suitcases filled with books to read to the kids in the classroom, or loading the bus and driving halfway across the country to read to kids, or most recently, outfitting bicycles with baskets so that librarians can go and read to kids. The mission has always been the same. How we attack or approach that mission changes, changes all the time. Changes because of COVID, changes because of new partners who arrive and make, um, you know, generous donations. So, so, so we're, very, we're very flexible on the how we do it, but we've always remained true to what we're doing. In, in the USA, a long time ago, uh, there were bookmobiles. Actual, you know, some were drawn by horses on, on wagons. Some were buses that were customized to drive around in the communities and give access to books or in a more modern setting to give, you know, Wi-Fi, Internet access. But, but really, just tie, you know, libraries are an important function in a community. And so not everybody can get to the library. So why the library here? Why the bookmobile here? Uh, we visited a couple of schools and saw, again, libraries that needed, that could benefit from some more, some more books. But we couldn't bring a million books. We could only bring a small collection, as, though we tried to bring a million books. <laughs> and we do, every time we get on an airplane, bring more and more books. So we decided it was easier to bring the books to the kids than to uh, try to get one book for every child. Different books. Different books in French, yeah. in Kinyuanda, in English. Yeah. And we incorporated uh, sign language and Braille. There is a book famine for blind children in Rwanda, so we're using embroidery to make Braille books as well. So I'll stop there because I've, I've covered all of that, but I wanted you to see Shannon's face. She's got a great smile. Um, so I have sort of come to the end of, of this, and I'd like to open up to questions. But before I do, I want to introduce you to my little buddy named Ivan. <laughs> That's why I do what I do, because I even got a new bike and a new book. So. That's the bulk of this presentation. I would be happy to answer some questions if you have some. And we've got a website, we've got all of the social media stuff, so if you're interested, you can continue to follow this story online at read.rw for the American side, but read is where all of the action is.